So the new beers criteria just came out, hot off the press in January. And um, if you had not, have not seen them, just email me and I'll send you the article. I also wrote a small uh, commentary for practice update on the new beers criteria. Thank you. So we'll talk about pharmacological principles and how they um, are affected by normal aging changes. We'll talk about common prescribing errors that we make, um, drug-drug interactions, and then how to approach safe prescribing in older adults. Which pharmacologic um, kinetic is least affected by aging? They're all affected to some degree, but which one is least affected? Absorption, distribution, metabolism, or elimination. Who thinks absorption? Distribution, metabolism, and elimination. All right. Yes. <laughs> so absorption is least affected. It takes longer for us to absorb the food or the drugs that we take in, but motility also slows as we get older. That's why we have a lot more constipation in our older adults. So overall absorption is about the same. It just takes longer. So that has implications with mealtime insulin, for example. The analogs that take effect very quickly within 10 minutes can oftentimes lead to hypoglycemia in our older adults who take much longer to absorb the food at mealtime. Um, drug distribution is definitely affected. We are born with about 70% of body water. At age 80, women have about 40% of body water, men about 50%. They have more muscle mass. Um, so water-soluble drugs are, have reduced distribution. And the muscle mass, as we get older, is largely replaced by adipose tissue. So fat-soluble drugs are much, more, much longer stored in older adults and can release for much longer periods of time. So fat-soluble drugs are particularly psych medications except for lithium. Protein binding can also be decreased in older adults, and that affects medications such as phenytoin, warfarin, digoxin, and we'll talk a little bit more about protein binding later on. Then liver metabolism decreases due to apoptosis of the liver cells, but also decreased perfusion to the liver cells. So if you take an extract of an older liver and compare it to a younger liver and you run the uh, reactions in a lab, the metabolism is the same. However, if you have it in vivo, then older adults definitely have decreased metabolism on the liver level, and that affects medications that are CYP450 metabolized. And drug elimination is definitely um, <coughs> decreased, and you all recognize that. There is apoptosis of the nephrons, particularly the long ones that concentrate the urine most effectively, but um, elimination just is decreased, and there's higher rate of dehydration for several reasons, and higher rate of constipation, also impairing elimination. So creatinine clearance, we can calculate with either the cockroft galt, most of our labs calculate creatinine clearance using the MDRD, the modification of diet and renal disease. And in comparison, they're pretty much the same for most purposes. But if you get a, a lab back where the creatinine clearance is right around 30 and you have to adjust, let's say, an antibiotic in a septic patient, then you might want to recalculate it using the cockroft gault formula, which is a little bit more accurate in older adults to see if you're falling above or below the 30 to adjust the antibiotic. But for most purposes, the MDRD is fine to use. So um, absorption is least affected by older adults. So this is one of my patients. Uh, at the time, she was 92 and presented with mental status changes. Which medication is least likely to cause mental status changes? Who thinks oxybutynin? How about actinel, okay. zolpidem, and meperidine? The majority of the rules. You did very well with that. Yes. Um, so most of those are anticholinergic medications, and they affect uh, older adults disproportionately more. Just think we don't have a lot of acetylcholine floating around in our brain, so that um, 
if we interfere with that by giving an anticholinergic medication, it really can decrease uh, cognition and impair um, impaired judgment or cause delirium. These are the categories that fall into anticholinergic medications, and they're all on the beers list. And that includes diphenhydramine, which is over the counter, hydroxazine or meclizine, which we oftentimes give to older adults for dizziness. So instead of giving that, ask how much water are you drinking? Could it be dehydration that's causing the dizziness? This is a table that you can pull up online of various medications, anticholinergic effects. And it's really amazing what medications are on there. Um, Venlafaxine, warfarin has mild anticholinergic effects. But of course, the big ones are the bladder medications, like in our patient, the oxybutamine. <coughs> Antihistamines are highly anticholinergic and um, <coughs> paradine. Do you still use meparidine at this hospital? No, good. It has been taken off the formulary in most hospitals at UW. It is still available. Um, metoclopramide, we should not be using either, um, at least not over 12 weeks. And then H2 blockers. And that has changed with the last iteration of the Beers criteria in January. Used to, H2 blockers were uh, to be avoided in all older adults, they revised that and said not to be used in patients with dementia or with delirium because of the anticholinergic effects. But for most patients, most older adults who are cognitively intact, H2 blockers are acceptable. And that gives us an option for uh, tapering off patients off of proton pump inhibitors, which have a lot of adverse effects, and we'll talk more about those in a minute. So long-term proton pump inhibitors can cause hypomagnesemia, um, osteoporosis, aspiration pneumonia, C. diff, I mean, a number of things. So we should really try to limit the um, length of proton pump inhibitors, and the Beers criteria recommend eight weeks. Some of our patients do need to stay on them long term, such as patients with Barrett's esophagus, of course. But um, try to limit the proton pump inhibitors. It's and a no increase in pneumonia there. It's, is that just differentiating from aspiration pneumonia? It's even a community-acquired pneumonia. And we don't really know why that is. Um, so there are lots of studies out there with, for pneumonia. Um, so this association says no. Other studies have shown that there is a, an association. I don't know. But I would advocate to avoid the proton pump inhibitors if we can. Um, increased risk with recurrent C. diff, especially in combination with um, several other drugs. And um, so, like I said, in patients with Barrett's, Patients who need to use corticosteroids and maybe also blood thinners might be good candidates to use proton pump inhibitors or now the H2 blockers if the patient's cognitively intact. So if you try to get somebody off long-term proton pump inhibitors, taper them slowly, and then use them and acid to bridge them because there is a hypersecretion of acid after you stop the proton pump inhibitor for about three or four days. And I warn my patients of that when I get them off of the proton pump inhibitor. I'll tell them, go ahead and take Tums. But if they say, oh, I've tried that before and it didn't work, then I usually bridge them. And I used to bridge them with, um, with caraphate, but now that we have H2 blockers available as well, we could use those as well. And that just coat, the caraphate just coats them so that they don't feel the hypersecretion as much and then it goes away after a couple of days. Tricyclic antidepressants are on the beers list, are highly <coughs> anticholinergic, and we don't routinely use them anymore. If you have to use one, nortriptyline is the least offensive for our older adults. The antimuscarinics were, uh, used to be touted when they came on the market about 20 years ago. The drug reps would say, oh, they're not anticholinergic, they're antimuscarinic. Well, the effect is the same on the patients. Um, there is some data that trospium does not cross the blood-brain barrier, but in reality, I have seen delirium from it just the same. So try to avoid these. 
Instead, tell the patient that they need to drink lots of fluid early in the day because a concentrated urine is very irritating to the bladder and can cause incontinence. So it's counterintuitive. And my patients will oftentimes say, are you crazy? I'll never get out of the bathroom. And I'll say, just try it. You know, give, me, give it a chance. And most of them say, when they come back, say, it really worked. And of course, avoiding bladder irritants such as caffeine. Yes? Do you have paroxetine on the tricyclic Is there something special about paroxetine and Axel? Yeah, so paroxetine is anticholinergic, and that's why we should not use it in older adults. It's on the beers list. Um, other SSRIs are better choices in older adults. Um, my first choice is um, citalopram because it's generic, it's cheap, it has few drug interactions, but um, because the QT prolongation, I will move to escitalopram when it becomes cheaper. It's now generic, but it's still much more expensive than escitalopram. So um, Franz Kafka in 1916 also already said, you know, prescribing medication is easy. Communicating with our patients is difficult. So trying to get our patients off of medications and use alternative uh, treatments is the challenge. Um, antispasmodics, uh, muscle relaxants also contribute to that, um, are very anticholinergic. Um, and neuroleptics, the older, the first generation neuroleptics also increase, uh, have highly anticholinergic effects. And um, sometimes we still use um, Phenergan for nausea, but with the Dancitron now, we're using less of that. And Parkinson's medications. When you think of delirium, it's an imbalance between uh, dopamine and, and um, acetylcholine. So I, either an absolute or a relative excess of dopamine and an absolute or relative um, deficit of acetylcholine can cause delirium. So if you decrease the acetylcholine even more, or if you increase the dopamine even more, you lead to delirium and you, you increase that imbalance. And that's how Parkinson's medication can cause delirium, can cause hallucinations. So titrating those medications very carefully is important. So um, meds to avoid in Parkinson's patients are particularly the anti uh, antipsychotic medications. Um, but if you need to use them, then the least offensive ones are quetiapine, uh, clozapine, which we don't use because of the blood dyscrasias, and prevanserin is the new kid on the block. We don't have a lot of data on that yet, and it's quite expensive. Muscle relaxants are highly anticholinergic and are on the beers list, should not be used in older adults. So what can we do for muscle cramps? Um, uh, we launched a study about 15, 20 years ago looking at mustard for muscle cramps, but before we enrolled our patients, we made sure that their uh, potassium level was normal and we put them all on calcium twice a day for osteoporosis prevention. And we never enrolled anybody because everybody's muscle cramps went away with the calcium. So I've been using calcium twice a day for muscle cramps for years with good success. And I even have gotten some of my paraplegics off of the baclofen with using calcium. And if necessary, I'll also add some magnesium at bedtime. It's a little bit sleep promoting and it would interfere the, with the absorption of the calcium because both are bivalent cations. So you don't want to give them together. So calcium twice a day and magnesium at bedtime. What sort of calcium do you use? Does it matter? Um, I use calcium carbonate, and it is the most, so calcium carbonate contains 40% of elemental calcium compared to the calcium citrate, it's 21%. So you get more bang with you, uh, for your buck. For by far the most patients, that is fine. The only time that it, um, you would need to use calcium citrate, if somebody is on proton pump inhibitor and really have suppressed all of their acid, and they don't eat meals during the day because as long as it's taken with a meal, calcium carbonate is absorbed just as well as the calcium citrate and even with acid suppression, as long as it's taken with a meal. So calcium carbonate is by far my first choice. And be careful with calcium citrate. Most formulations require two pills to get the 500 milligrams of elemental calcium because the molecular moiety is just so much larger. 
Benzodiazepines are on the beers list, should not be used, and also the Z drugs. Um, they have a lot of devastating effects, including um, cognitive impairment and delirium, but they also suppress um, REM sleep, and REM sleep is critically important to work things up emotionally. So in the 1950s and 60s, when we, when we didn't really know and didn't have any better drugs, we used to give these medications in response to a grief reaction a lot. But that oftentimes led to then prolonged grief because people never really worked up their grief because they suppressed their REM sleep. And if you suppress REM sleep long enough, you end up with depression. So try to avoid these medications. Individual uh, patients might benefit from a dose of lorazepam to get on an airplane, for example, or to um, undergo a procedure. Or if they're really anxious about the dentist, then you know that's fine. Just don't use it on a regular basis. And there seems to be a, a cumulative relationship with causing dementia long term. The non-benzodiazepine hypnotics are also on the beers list and should not be used. Um, this is the study that inc uh, showed increased risk of dementia. There are multiple studies out there, and I have a couple of them in here on also on anticholinergics. <coughs> and anticholinergics and dementia seem to be cumulative throughout life. So be careful with how much Benadryl you give your patients. And this showed actually also um, temporal lobe atrophy on MRI with increased use of anticholinergic medications. So definitely benzodiazepines and anticholinergic medications have been um, implicated with dementia. There's very strong evidence for that. Possibly with proton pump inhibitors, statins, and alpha blockers. There are some studies that promoted, other studies have refuted it. So stay tuned, but just be mm -hmm. careful in using these drugs that are on the beers list. So a lot of um, adverse drug reactions occur with our medications. The biggest implicated are warfarin and insulins because of hypoglycemia and because of bleeding risk. So the red flag list of medications is the beers criteria in this country. And I'll talk a little bit about the start and stop criteria in Europe that is used there. But the Beers criteria came into being under Dr. Mark Beers in 1992 and were revised repeatedly over the years. Initially, it was thought, oh, it's just an expert opinion. But since 2012, it's a highly evidence-based document. And at the time, they based it on 25,000 studies. The revision then added another 20,000 studies in 2015. And the latest one this year um, added another 17,000 studies. And um, that's because more and more older adults are included in research studies. Historically, they were excluded because it's difficult to get consent in somebody who is not cognitively intact. They have a lot of medications, a lot of comorbidities that can confound research studies. So they were historically excluded. But there was a big backlash, and we've included a lot more patients in research, older patients in research studies because we're using these medications in older patients. So there is much more data available now. So the start and stop criteria are the ones in um, Europe. And um, the latest iteration of that was in 2015. And these are the resources. There are 80 stop criteria and 34 start criteria. And these are the major differences between the start, uh, stop criteria and the beers criteria. So in Europe, under the stop criteria, Dijoxin is considered to have no benefit. It actually has been shown to increase mortality by 25%. The Beers criteria still allow Dijoxin um, at low doses. Um, the, uh, the SSRIs are on the Beers, uh, on the stop criteria because of hyponatremia. They're not on the Beers criteria except for paroxetine, as you had pointed out. Um, but be careful with hyponatremia in all patients on um, psychotropic drugs, whether it's antidepressants, antipsychotics, benzodiazepines. All psych drugs cause hyponatremia except for Wellbutrin. So psych drugs are actually pretty easy to remember. They're all fat soluble except for lithium. They're all hepatically cleared except for lithium. They're all um, 
they all cause hyponatremia except for Wellbutrin. So three easy rules with side drugs. These are the start criteria. Those are recommendations of what to use in older adults. And that includes um, <coughs> patients on AFib should be on blood thinners. Um, patients with um, CHF should be on ACE inhibitors, and so on. So this is a number of inappropriately uh, used medications in hospitals in uh, 2014. And the BEERS criteria identified about half of the inappropriate medications, uh, about 58%. The STOP criteria identified about 50%. And the combination would have identified 75%. So my big push is to just get all together at the same table and come up with one big document. Orthostatic hypotension can be pretty devastating in our older adults with alpha blockers. So be careful, especially the first four weeks after starting alpha blockers. And even tamsulosin can cause orthostatic hypotension, even though it's alpha-1A specific to the prostate. Other um, potent vasodilators, such as dipyrimol and nifedipine, can cause um, orthostasis and are on the beers list because they can cause watershed infarcts in the territory mm -hmm. right between the anterior and the middle cerebral artery when you're decreasing perfusion of the brain. So spironolactone in higher doses can cause hyper, um, hyperkalemia. And that's because in older adults, the kidney are, kidneys are not as good at getting rid of potassium as they are in younger adults. Trimethoprim um, is contraindicated in uh, patients with severe renal failure because it is renally cleared and can cause hyperkalemia as well. Dextromethorphan and quinidine um, can cause falls and uh, drug interactions. It's a new drug that has been touted for um, pseudobulbar affect. So these spontaneous crying and laughing episodes that can occur in our older adults I have not found it helpful. And what I have usually done is if I got a request by either family or staff to use the, this new drug for um, um, suitable by affect, then I would try the patient just on dextromethorphan because for a few days that's good enough until the CYP 450 revs up and you really need to use the quinidine. And in my trial of maybe a dozen patients that I've tried it on, for the first three days I saw no benefit. And it, it should take have a benefit right away. So I have not found it very helpful. There's also some data showing that, that it can help with delirium, and I have not found that either. So digoxin should not be used in higher doses. And in patients with renal um, impairment, even lower doses need to be used, and sometimes we can get away with it just once or twice a week. So be very careful and check levels if you have somebody with renal impairment on digoxin. And then desmopressin is a fairly new medication that has been touted for nocturia, um, and it can cause hyponatremia. So older adults are at higher risk of dehydration because not only do we not feel thirsty as we get older, but we also don't make enough antidiuretic hormone in our brain due to apoptosis of our brain cells. Even if we made enough antidiuretic hormone or use desmopressin nasal spray to increase the antidiuretic hormone, our kidneys are not capable of concentrating the urine as effectively because the long nephrons have atrophied. So um, using desmopressin is not effective, and I've admitted two patients when I was on uh, hospital service over Christmas with uh, hyponatremia, and I asked them, who were on this medication, and I asked them if it was effective for their nocturia, and they said, no, it didn't do any, made any, it made no difference. So I have not used it, and I would caution you if your patients ask about it. If you do prescribe it, follow up closely with them and check their sodium level. They were admitted with delirium from hyponatremia. And this is a, a couple of studies showing no benefit of digoxin and increased mortality by 25%, which led the stop criteria to just avoid digoxin altogether. Rate control is better than rhythm control. 
in um, atrial fibrillation. So the antiarrhythmics are on the beers list and should not be used. If your cardiologist puts your patient on a um, antiarrhythmic, monitor them very closely. It usually takes about four to six to eight weeks to show any CNS active side effects for the level to cross the blood brain barrier at high enough uh, at a high enough threshold. So monitor your patient a few weeks out after they've started these medications. At the beginning, you won't notice anything, but then a few weeks out. They'll oftentimes have ataxia, fall, get confused. So caution your parent, patients about it and monitor them closely. Blood thinners, use them with caution. Aspirin um, made the list now that we have more data showing of the, uh, the lack of benefit in older adults, um, except in patients with, with diabetes who are over 70. Aspirin should not be used for prevention. And then rivaroxaban was added to the Beers criteria this year in addition to dabagatran, which has been on the uh, Beers criteria in the past because of the increased risk of bleeding. So the um, DOACs, a direct um, acting um, um, anticoagulants, they were compared to warfarin in the therapeutic range 62 to 65% of the time in the studies that led to the FDA approval. So that's what then showed that, well, the benefits are more so with the DOACs than they are with warfarin. However, <laughs> at UW, our therapeutic range is 79% of the time and warfarin in the, uh, between 2 and 3 for AFib. So if you compare the DOACs with warfarin at 79% in the therapeutic range, then warfarin would come out ahead. So know your, your institution's therapeutic range and then choose. Yes, if your patient is difficult to control on warfarin, definitely the DOAC would be a better option. But if your patient is easy to control and stays in the therapeutic range, then staying with warfarin in older adults is definitely more beneficial. And subsequent studies that have come out did not look at um, therapeutic range when they compared warfarin with DOACs. And they showed great benefit uh, by the DOACs over warfarin. But again, they did not look at the therapeutic <coughs> range and one study out of Taiwan then post hoc looked at the therapeutic range and their therapeutic range was 20%. So, you know, especially looking at data from other countries where the, the care may not be as, as good, we have to be very critical about those studies that are coming out. Barbiturates are at high, um, are high risk, and we don't really use those in our patients anymore. The ones with the star are those that we don't really use anymore. So this is our 92-year-old. Um, she has some mental status changes. The only medication that she's taking is the alendronate. She has no allergies. She has some suprapubic tenderness. Her urinalysis shows 2-plus leukocyte esterase and ha has positive nitrites too numerous to count white cells, and no RBCs. Do you start empiric treatment or do you wait? Who would, who would put her on trimethoprim sifomethoxazole? Who would put her on Cipro? How about nitrofurantoin? How about amoxicillin? And how about wait until we get culture results? All right, great. Yeah, especially because she only has really two um, two identifiers on the McGear criteria. She has suprapubic tenderness and some mental status changes. But other than that, she really doesn't qualify for even a UA, much less. So yeah, it could be just dehydration. But let's say she also has another side effect, She ha uh, another symptom. She has burning and frequency. So that would then give her the McGear criteria. Which would you use then? Who would use trimethoprim? Who would use Cipro? Who would use nitrofurantoin? And who would use amoxicillin? Okay, yeah. So um, you're right not to use nitrofurantoin because it only works in the urinary tract. And you know that she already has bacteria in the blood because she has mental status changes. So either the bacteria or the inflammatory cytokines have crossed the blood brain barrier to cause delirium. So we need something that's systemic. Trimethoprim, you have to be careful with protein-bound drugs, but she's not on any protein-bound drugs. 
So this would be a good option for her. Cipro is not a good option, you're right about that. High risk of delirium in older adults and C. diff high risk. And amoxicillin, the problem with that is because she has nitrites positive, we're probably dealing with a gram-negative bacteria because gram-negative bacteria turn nitrites into nitrites. And therefore, we would want to cover gram-negatives. So maybe using augmentin rather than amoxicillin might be a better choice. And I would probably not wait because she has mental status changes if I think that she has a UTI. But if she doesn't have the McGear criteria symptoms, then I would wait and see, and see how hydration does. Just give her some fluids, either orally or by IV. And these are the McGear criteria for your review, and it sounds like you already know that. So it's excellent. Let's talk a little bit about pain management. I usually start off with scheduled Tylenol, but I also use a lot of um, topicals such as lidocaine, topical NSAIDs. Um, so Lawn Plus is over the counter now. It's a nice uh, patch. If I need to, or if we need to, we can add opioids, but titrate very <coughs> carefully and avoid meperidine. Benzodiazepines at the end of life can be adjunct uh, to pain medications and can potentiate the pain medication effects. So think of that, and uh, try to avoid antiemetics with antidopaminergic action, so we're using odansetron for the most part now. In patients with behavioral problems in dementia, um, use non-medication first. And um, I have given you a talk on, on dementia before, so use the hand over hand that I showed you at the time. But in um, terms of medication management, one study showed, uh, a couple of studies have shown that Tylenol is quite effective in managing behaviors in older adults with dementia. And that is because many patients with advanced dementia cannot even perceive pain, much less express that they have pain. So they don't even know that they have pain. So we have to think for them. And I usually just start off with scheduled Tylenol to see if it makes a difference in their behavior. And I've also had a lot of good success with that. Then also SSRIs have been shown to be just as effective as antipsychotics for behavioral problems in dementia. That's usually my next go-to medication if behavioral interventions and Tylenol have not helped. Studies have shown no effect with trazodone and valproate, but in individual patients I have seen some good effects with both uh, or either of them. So try them. If it doesn't work, please stop these medications. I just started rounding this week on a patient who was on six different medications for her behavioral problems. And what happened is that she was started on one and it didn't work and then another one was added and then another one was added and none of them really worked because she's still having severe behavioral problems. But we don't know which one didn't work because it's a little bit better. So the family is hesitant to stop anything. So it's a real battle now. So if something doesn't work, don't just add something, but move laterally, stop it. And these medications that you try will have an effect within two or three days. So don't wait four weeks to follow up with your patient. These families are going through a lot of suffering in the meantime. So be very responsive as you make these changes. The Razapan, yeah. So even your SSRI, you're gonna see a result in two or three days? I have seen almost immediate response with those. Yes, you don't have to wait those 30 days like you do with depression. Yes, I have seen dramatic improvements right away. Mm -hmm. Lorazepam has not been shown to be beneficial, and I never found it helpful either until I moved to Wisconsin. And, and I have found a lot of my older women who were closet alcoholics really respond to lorazepam in the late afternoon where then, when they had their toddy. And nobody knows about it because the patient never admitted to it. So I will try lorazepam in a given patient and see if it works. And in a few patients, I've had some amazing responses. But you know, if it doesn't work, again, don't use it anymore. Carbamazepine, um, I have also found beneficial in an individual patient, but very little uh, evidence for that. So that would be way down on my list. Also on the beers list is are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. So 
Um, prostaglandins are vasodilators. NSAIDs are prostaglandin antagonists, so they cause vasoconstriction. Not a problem in a 20-year-old, but if you only have three coronaries and you choke off two of them, you end the, pa the patient ends up in heart failure. Same thing on the kidney level. If you constrict the, um, the arterioles in the kidneys, you can end up in renal failure. So don't use NSAIDs in our older adults. Increased risk of CHF exacerbation, AFib with NSAIDs, cardiovascular deaths, and also COX inhibitors, same effect. COX inhibitors have only GI protective benefits over NSAIDs for the first six months. After six months, they lose even that. And they have the same effect on the heart, the kidney, and the brain. Yeah? So what age do you consider that? Over 60 or 65? 65 is usually the cutoff that we use for this. But you all know you have some individual patients who are chronologically maybe 50, but biologically more like 85. And then you have some 80-year-old marathon runners who are more like, you know, 40-year-olds, although they still have some of those aging changes, those normal aging changes that can affect them. But I would probably be a little bit more, uh, more tolerant in those. So, yeah, use your judgment. But as a cutoff, we use 65. For heart failure, avoid silostazole uh, um, and, of course, NSAIDs, COX-2 inhibitors, um, the glitazones, um, avoid DPP-4 inhibitors. There was one study that showed that. Um, I just did a study converting um, almost 60% of my patients from insulin to DPP-4s, and I had no CHF exacerbations in my patients. So um, stay tuned. Um, opioids we sometimes use for pain. Make sure that you treat constipation proactively. If you start them on an opioid, start them on an um, osmotic agent such as Miralax, Lactulose, Sorbitol, whatever you use. Um, avoid stimulant laxatives, but sometimes with opioids you have to use them, but always start off with osmotic agents first. And um, morphine is the preferred opioid in elderly. There is no ceiling dose to morphine, to actually most opioids except for codeine, and codeine is on the beers list and should not be used in older adults. Also, postoperatively, think that as the pain decreases, you have to scale back on the opioid receptors. So if you have somebody with a hip fracture and then re hip replacement, they might need a lot of opioids the postoperative days, but then two or three days later, as their pain improves, scale back on the opioids because otherwise you have some of the side effects occur. So if the um, pain receptors are not gobbling up the opioids, then the free opioids lead to itching, nausea, and other symptoms. So if the patient complains of itching or nausea, instead of giving them Benadryl and Odansetron, think of scaling back on the opioid because they may not need as much anymore. Tramadol has been added to the beers list this year because of hyponatremia, but also it causes hypoglycemia, falls, and ataxia. And tramadol, in my experience, has been turning out to be a lot like uh, propoxyphene. Darvaset used to be many years ago. It's been taken off the market probably 15 years ago now. But it takes up to four weeks to show some of the side effects of tramadol. So short term, it's okay probably, but if you have a patient that needs opioids long term, don't use tramadol. It has a lot of side effects. The hyponatremia comes from the SNRI portion or the SNRI effect. Remember, all psych drugs can cause hyponatremia except for Wellbutrin. Um, so the tra hypoglycemia with tramadol can occur even in non-diabetics, which is really scary. Increased mortality with tramadol and um, renal and hepatic failure. Which opioid to use then? So morphine is our first choice in older adults, but if the patient has significant renal failure, uh, the metabolites of opioid can build up and cause CNS side effects. So try to avoid that. And then um, fentanyl is probably the safer choice for those patients. 
but fentanyl is not first line in older adults with the wrinkling of the skin and less subcutaneous fat, the absorption is more erratic in older adults. So oftentimes I don't have much success with fentanyl. So in, with opioids, patients get tolerant to all effects except which one? Which one persists? Is it respiratory depression? Is it constipation? Is it sedation? Nausea, vomiting? Or itching? You're right, so constipation does not go away. Everything else patients get tolerant to after about three days after the dose increase. So you can titrate up and up and up, and you don't get the itching, you don't get the respiratory depression, but you continue to get worsening constipation. Gabapentin and pregabalin made the beers list. Gabapentin was on the beers list the last go around in 2015. Pregabalin made it this year as well. Um, except in low doses, in very low doses, so like 100 milligrams of gabapentin. However, I have not found it to be very effective. Patients oftentimes say that they're getting better, and then I encourage them to get off of it after six months, and when I stop it, they're not getting worse. In my experience, and I've taken probably well over 100 patients off of their um, gabapentin, only one patient got worse. She had prostropatic neuralgia in her eye, and when I tapered her down, she got worse. And then I tapered her back up, she got better. I just kept her on her Neurontin. But everybody else, I tapered off the pregabalin or the gabapentin, and they did not get worse. So try it in your patients. These are not good drugs. They cause a lot of side effects, confusion in our older adults. So drug, drug interactions to avoid, especially gabapentinoids with um, opioids and opioids with benzos high overdose risk, high sedation risk, and respiratory depression risk. Hormones that are on the beers list are androgens. They have not been shown to be of any benefit. And a growth hormone can increase um, glucose levels and lead to uh, diabetes, but also cause um, arthralgias, edema, lots of other side effects. Oral estrogen should not be used in older adults. Vaginal estradiol is fine. Desiccated thyroid, we don't really know how much thyroid medication in each pill the patient gets, so it's difficult to titrate. And uh, one word about thyroid medicine, keep the TSH between four and six in older adults. That reduces the risk of osteoporosis, skin thinning, muscle atrophy, and AFib. Those are the new guidelines from the Thyroid Association that came out in 2014. Yeah, 2014. Um, so, and a BMJ article just recently also said that if the TSH in just screening patients and asymptomatic patients comes back less than 10, just repeat it within a year, and it normalizes in more than 90% of patients. So be very careful in starting patients on Synthroid verify, make sure that they're symptomatic, make sure that they really need it. And then keep the TSH between four and six if they are on medications. Megase, um, increased mortality, we don't use it anymore. Um, we don't know other, if other appetite stimulants also increase mortality. There's not been any patient outcomes data. We only have weight data. Yeah, they increase weight, but maybe they also increase mortality. Um, the sulfonylureas, the long-acting ones, can cause severe hypoglycemia, so they're on the beers list. And then the sliding scale insulin should not be used. And most of us have moved away from that anyway in older adults. We already talked about the anticholinergic side effects of the antipsychotics, the older generation, but even the newer generation antipsychotics should not be used in older adults. Um, high risk of mortality, mostly from infections. We don't really know exactly the mechanism, but also cardiac mortality. And there's a black box warning for that. So medications that can cause SIADH, we already talked about the psych drugs that can cause hyponatremia, but all diuretics and any angiotensin medication can contribute to it too. So ACE inhibitors, ARBs, spironolactone, and so on. Many sulfonylureas can cause SIADH and many anticonvulsants, and we already talked about tramadol. 
So if a patient comes in with hypornatremia, look at their medications first. In more than 90% of our older patients, it's medications. Very rarely is it a small cell lung cancer, and even more rarely is it polydipsia, because our older adults never drink that much. <laughs> it might be the case in a psychotic patient who is in their 20s or 30s, but not in older adults. So um, don't restrict their fluid intake, just stop the medications that might be causing this hyponatremia. Medications that contribute to falls is a long list of medications, a lot of categories. And um, the new ones that were added were the SNRIs to the beers list. But in individual patients, what are we going to do? You know, we're not supposed to use some of the SSRIs, not, some, not the SNRIs, not the, uh, the tricyclics. You know, we just have to bite the bullet and just monitor our patients. If their falls increased, change the medication, move laterally. So inappropriate prescribing is very prevalent. Don't feel bad if you found some of the medications that you're using on the list. It's okay. But try to stop these medications in our patients. They are more than willing to stop. In this study, 92% of patients were willing to stop medications. So bring it up to them and say, how about we stop the proton pump inhibitor? How about we stop uh, this or that medication? Let's talk a little bit about drug-drug interactions. If you do have a drug-drug interaction, try to adjust the dose, try to eliminate one of the medications, um, and always monitor when you're adding a new medication for drug-drug interactions. So which drug could be added to warfarin without interaction? Who thinks Synthroid? Who thinks Phenytoin? How about Trimethoprim sulfa? metoprolol, and digoxin. Very good, you got it right. Metoprolol is the answer. So warfarin and uh, sulfa drug, uh, uh, interacts with sulfa drugs because of protein binding, macrolides because of the CYP450 system and metabolism, um, same thing with qu quinolones, NSAIDs because of the high bleeding risk with warfarin and NSAIDs, and then phenytoin and amiodarone are both um, protein bound and also CYP metabolized by the same mechanism. Digoxin, verapamil, and amiodarone all cause hypo, um, low pulse rate, <laughs> low pulse rate, bradycardia. And uh, phenytoin and sulfa drugs are both protein bound, so can interact. Quinolones and theophylline, calcium magnesium and iron supplements are all divalent cations. And remember how I said you don't want to give the magnesium and the calcium together because they're divalent cations. Same thing with quinolones. We know about doxycycline and the tetracyclines. They interact with divalent cations, but also theophylline and the quinolones. So if you have a patient on calcium or magnesium, um, just stop the medication while they're on the antibiotic and then resume it when they get off. That's the safest. Also, for uh, potassium-sparing medications, be careful in the use of ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and spironolactone. And trimethoprim has also been shown in patients with renal impairment to cause hyperkalemia. And then lithium can, con can cause toxicity with ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and loop diuretics by interfering with the renal function. So renal clearance is decreased of lithium. And then steroids with NSAIDs, high risk of bleeding. So try to avoid it. But if you have to have somebody on both of those medications, that might be a patient as a candidate for an acid suppressing medicine, either a proton pump inhibitor or an H2 blocker. So our 92-year-old with a creatinine of 1.1 and a clearance of 23 can take a normal dose of which of these medications? Is it alendronate, cipro, citalopram, trimethoprim, or lithium? Excellent, you got it. Citalopram is the right answer. Yeah. So citalopram is hepatically metabolized, like all psych drugs except for lithium, and all the others are renally metabolized, so you need to make adjustments for it. 
So start low and increase slowly, establish a diagnosis, avoid treating symptoms, focus on the quality of life of our patients primarily rather than treatment of, of um, diseases, and look for therapeutic duplication, try to stop medications, check for over-the-counter medications and supplements that might interfere with the medications, anticipate problems, give the patient some anticipatory guidance of what side effects to expect, and then talk to the patient and the caregiver of what to expect. See the patient regularly, review the meds at every visit, attempt to use one drug to, uh, in the um, treatment of more than one condition, communicate with other prescribers, maybe your cardiologist or nephrologist, avoid using um, more than one drug from a class with similar actions, and in conclusion, make sure to calculate the renal clearance, avoid anticholinergic medications, different drug distribution, metabolism, and elimination in the elderly increases the risk of drug interactions, and consult the ags beers criteria. Any questions or comments? Yes? At what level would you think a low sodium would warrant a change in a medication? And uh, how long would you expect the sodium to normalize or improve after stopping what you think to be the offending medication? Yeah. So I don't get excited until it gets less than 125. So I'm much more tolerant than most people are, as long as the patient is not symptomatic, not falling, and those kind of things. But um, it will normalize very rapidly after you stop the medication. Within a couple of days, it will increase. I mean, the next day, you will already see a rise, and then it will be normal in a couple more days. It also depends on how long the patient has been on the medication, of course, but I see a very rapid return to normal. Yeah? And then Is there an online reference or an app that you know of that talks about uh, over-the-counters and alternative therapies and what we might expect for their interactions or potential toxicities? Because they seem very popular, but you know, I search the internet, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. There are several books out there, but they are not very up to date. I would always just ask a pharmacist then. Some pharmacists are better at keeping up with over-the-counter and supplements than others. But, um, if, you know, there are some books out there, but they're a bit dated. And, you know, things change all the time. So I don't have a good answer for you. I'm sorry. You next, and then you. So, trend all, I can see many reasons why you wouldn't want to prescribe. But if you have a vigorous over 80, lots of osteoarthritis, horrible back pain, usually like a low dose hydrocodone, a low dose oxycodone, then to keep them with their quality of life. Yeah, I usually use low dose oxycodone because then I don't have the Tylenol attached to it and I can type, schedule the Tylenol and use the oxycodone as needed. And I usually just give a half a pill and Recently, I started one patient on a very low dose because the family said she got delirious on a half a pill of oxycodone. So I actually gave the liquid and gave uh, point, 0.5 milligrams. So I started really, really low, and she tolerated that and got pain relief. So just homeopathic doses, just <laughs> take a whiff. <laughs> okay, lick it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, lick it. Yeah. Do you ever use uh, the GFR instead of doing the full creatinine clearance? How do you compare next? Yeah, so I usually use the estimated GFR that's reported in our labs. I use it for the majority of my patients, and it's severe, uh, 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 reasonably accurate. However, if you fall right at the border where you have to adjust the medication, so for example, for um, many antibiotics, you have to adjust up or down at a creatinine clearance of 30. And if you have a pretty sick patient, then I would do the Cockroft gall to get a more accurate reading of the creatinine clearance so I know which way to fall, to dose the antibiotic up or down. If you have a critically ill patient, you don't want to underdose them. If they're not so sick, I would fall on the underdosing side. But, you know, use your judgment. But, yes, you're right. For by far the most part, I use the EGFR. Mm -hmm. Yeah? One last question about um, low-dose narcotics and elderly with chronic are you having them sign a contract? Are you having them do urine drug screenings? Because I find that they look at me and they are like, what are you asking me to do? Exactly. Because sometimes they can't even get the urine because they are in so much pain or right. so arthritic. How are you handling that? I don't do it. 
but all my clinics are doing it and are requiring our patients to do it. And um, you know, in the nursing homes or in assisted living, we're controlling the medications. Right. So it's a, not, it's a moot issue. Right. But in most of my older adults, I don't do it because I'm not worried that they're selling it. That's what you want to get the urine drug screen for, to make sure that they're taking it and not selling it. But my older adults just don't. Now, I might do it in a patient who is exceeding what I expect them to take. When I'm questioning things, then I would do it, but not routinely. Yeah. As family members can take it. Absolutely, exactly. And you know, oftentimes I will address it with my patients. If I'm escalating their drugs and they're saying they're not getting pain relief, I'm saying, do you think your daughter might be replacing your opioid with vitamin C? in your pill box, you know? I address it with them, but it's pretty rare that that happens, yeah. Mm -hmm. How much time do you get your average patient? Just curious. You know, I'm in a regular clinic now, and I am struggling with my older patients in a 20-minute visit, and then sometimes I'll bring them back with a longer visit, 40-minute visit. But yeah, it's a challenge. And I have really found limiting the amount of information I cover in a given visit is very, very helpful. So I, t I train my patients to come in with a list and then we'll address the first three items on that list and then we'll schedule an appointment for follow-up for the rest of the items and for my items that I've added. So yeah, it, it's a challenge, absolutely. And um, geriatrics, so there is some, there are some data out there. Uh, for most geriatric clinics, they use 30-minute visits and 60 minutes for new patients. But of course we don't get paid significantly more for that. So that's why geriatricians make less money than the average family doctor and internist. Yeah, it's a problem. Thank you everybody. Thank you.